We need God's help, don't we? Every single day. I want to tell you, man, the moment you think you don't need God's help or everything's good enough, that's when you're in trouble. We need God's help in everything that we do. Somebody once said, you know, it's easier for us to pray when and be desperate upon God when things aren't going our way. You know, we can start being faithful more, giving more, coming to church more. But one of the real dangers and the true test of a man and woman is who is that person when success comes their way? When everything starts going right for them, are they still as desperate? I want to tell you, that song we just sang, God Help Us, it should be more desperate in our hearts when things start going good because that's when things will try to take the place of God. How you keep God on the throne is by saying, Lord, you know what, no matter what's happening, I still need you. I'm still desperate. So we're going to come before the throne of grace boldly, praying, asking God to continue to help us, help our surrounding area, our churches, friends, family members, co-workers. Challenge yourself, say, you know what, Lord, I want to be a light wherever I am, whether I'm at my job or I'm at a grocery store. God, I want to be a light. I want to draw people to church, draw people to Christ, man. Continue to pray for our nation. Um, pray for the world right now. We are in a time right now where things are shifting biblically. Most can look at it and say, oh, well, it's just a Russian madman invading Ukraine. But I want to tell you, things are shifting biblically, pointing to the end and return of Jesus Christ. Read your Bible. You will see that Ezekiel 38, 39 is playing out right before our eyes, man. This thing is happening. So I want to challenge you right now more than ever. Say, you know what, God? I may not make it on. Or Jesus, you may come back. You know what I mean? Jesus may come back because it's right here. It's imminent. The rapture is imminent, man. It's not the time they play around with salvation. Say, so you know what, God? I'm going to take this serious, man. So I want to challenge you. Be faithful. Continue to love each other, man. Love each other. Jesus said the mark that you pass from death to life is that you love the fellowship. Continue to love each other. Don't let cause division because God is about unity, which means the devil is about division. Say, you know what? No, devil, I'm not going to let you destroy my bonds with my church family. Because I bet you, some of us like me, some of you just like me, you have a closer bond with your church family than your actual family. That's how I was growing up. My church family became my brothers, my sisters, my aunts, my uncles, right? My spiritual father. So I want to tell, don't let the enemy destroy this. Let's open up the service in prayer. How many of you have a need on your heart spoken? You can signify that, raise your hand. I want to tell you, God sees your heart. I want to challenge you, lift your voice right now. Bring that before God as we go ahead and lift our voice together. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we come before you to say thank you for what you're doing. God, we ask that you would continue to have your way in this place, in our hearts, in our lives. We come against Satan. We come against every lie from hell. We bind every dominant strategy, God, to tear down through false do doctrine, God. To tear apart, my God, faith. To bring confusion. God, I pray, shed light on your word. Shed light, God, on the biblical principles. Lord, that will be our anchor, Father. Lord, I pray, pour your spirit out upon this place. Lord, move supernaturally. Tear down and uproot everything that needs to go. And build and plant and establish all that needs to stay. I pray, supernaturally anoint this service. Charge it by the Holy Ghost. I have no confidence in my flesh. Nor in my ability, God. Your conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I ask that you have right away, Holy Ghost. Move in this place upon every heart. Speak your word with clarity and authority. Draw the sinner, draw in this place. And we thank you, Father. We give you glory, honor, and praise for what you're going to do on tonight. And Lord, we surrender this service over to you. We ask that you would have right away in this place all these things we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Let's take the time to greet one another. Yes, you can. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Wow. 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 You got to work. You got to work. Okay. How about your hand crack? Wow. 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 Is she taking you from a distance? 
Wow. What, what power? I'm just waiting because I'm right blocking, right? <laughs> Back at the chair. Really? Yeah, Sorry, Bart. Hey. hey, Bart. Come here. Hey, Bart. <laughs> hey, Bart. Hey, Bart. Hey, Bart. Hey, Bart. Hey, Bart. I see you waving. I see you waving. Wow. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. We are here. It's always a privilege to be in church. I want to tell you, man, we all need this Wednesday refresher. You know, what's amazing is that, you know what I mean? It's like you drive your car now and I said the average price for gas in LA is like six, seven bucks. You know what I mean? For them now to get a, like a Wednesday refresher, you know what I mean? Some people are paying almost a hundred bucks for like a Honda Accord now. You know what I mean? To fill up their tank. But what's the amazing thing about this Wednesday refresher is it's always the same, man. That God doesn't inflate. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So I'm appreciative of this. Um, just quick announcements. We're here Wednesday, Sunday, same time, same place. Be here uh, join us. We're having a tremendous time, fellowship, praying together, hearing from God. We pray an hour before each service. We meet Thursdays. Uh, we'll be here tomorrow at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, probably be here around like 6.45, get the coffee pot going, and uh, whatever we can grab our hands on to eat, we'll pray together, lay a hold of God, and we'll fellowship. Now, we'll have a great time. Uh, Heidi will be with us tomorrow from San Antonio. So we're going to break her into some chicken and coffee style. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to break her into that Jersey kid. You know, it's just like you got the weird out here, man. So we're going to break her in, man. She'll be with us uh, this week. This weekend, uh, this Saturday, we'll be going up to the Statue of Liberty. We'll have a great time. We'll get everything squared away. What happened? We'll get everything squared away um, as far as arrangements. And everyone's who's coming, who's coming, so we can have all that squared away. It's going to be a tremendous time. It's a very good, um, it's a very good place to visit. You know, what I mean, that's a, that's where our history is. We we learn so much when you go through Ellis Island. They have, I mean, it's impossible to go through on one shot. But you start in the beginning. You go through, you know, when when you know the settlers came. The the you know you got pilgrims talk. You got the whole uh, uh, Indians. It's everything that just flows through Ellis Island. And you get to walk through the hallway. Is where these somewhat millions, maybe millions of people flow through there, man. Coming from Poland, Russia, European countries because of oppression. And here they flow through these very halls. And we get to see that. And there's a lot of rich history there um, at Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty. And so take in what you can. Soak it in. There's a lot of tutorials. I, I hope that movie is there. Island of Tears, I think. Something like that. But it's a phenomenal film. I hope we get to watch that. It's about 30 minutes. So, I'm excited about Saturday. We've been there several times, but it doesn't get old, man, because each time you go, you can see something new. You learn something new about uh, the history of our country. So, that's going to be this Saturday. In the meantime, we're going to continue to be faithful, man. Be faithful in your witness. Be faithful in your testimony, man. People have been getting saved. Uh, we've been able to pray with people. Um, just wherever we are, man, be faithful, man. When you go to your job, have some flyers on you. Say, hey, man, can I invite you out to church, tell you about Jesus, what he's done in my life, what he's doing. You know what I mean? I, I feel amazing. You know what I mean? You may not be able to put words to it, but you know what? There's something inside of you that someone else needs to hear that God's doing. You know what I mean? Tell someone about that. And the, the joys, the peace, the, the ease of your mind because of what Jesus did for you. So that's what we got going on. We're going to take the time very quickly for our tithes and offering. Be faithful in your giving, man. God has been helping us tremendously. I'm super excited to see what he's been doing. And I want to tell you, man, you take care of God's business, he'll take care of yours. Trust me. I've been doing this for a long time. I don't I don't recall a time where I've ever given God more than he's given me. Trust me. <laughs> you may say, oh, man, it's 10%. That's 10%. That's my paycheck. That's 10% of my paycheck. Trust me. What God gives in return, man, listen, there's nothing. You, you can't outgive God. He has a bigger shovel, man. Trust me. So be faithful in your giving, your tithes. And, and be a part of what God's doing here, souls getting saved, lives being touched. And I want to tell you, man, we're sending our finances ahead when we're giving. So we're going to go ahead and pray over our tithes and offering and ask God to bless it. God, we thank you for this time to give into your kingdom. Lord, I pray every soul that was part in your tithes and your offering, as you said to have meat in your house. Lord, I pray open up the windows of heaven for them, God. Lord, for jobs. 
for apartments, for raises. God, full-time appointment, God. We ask that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. Lord, that they can't even believe it. Blow their minds and show them. Lord, there is a true and living God that still wants to have meat in his house. Because if we take care of yours, you will take care of ours. Bless the tithe, the offering, the gift, and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing out King Moran. hearing going on for a nomination of a of Supreme Court justice. Um, Biden had announced his pick and she's now going through her days of her hearing. They're questioning her pretty much. They're grilling her. They want to make sure the person they're putting on the stands as a Supreme Court justice of, of a judge that there's someone who pretty much has their head on right in so many words. Amy Coney Barrett, if you don't know her, her name, but she was the Supreme Court Justice that President Trump nominated back in 2020. And she got confirmed and she became the 103rd Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States back in October 27th, 2020. But before being confirmed in, she as well had to go through her hearing, where they pretty much ask you question after question, sometimes 12-hour hearings, 13-hour hearings, where you have to sit there and you're answering all these questions. And there, her hearing was a, a accumulation of 20 hours questioned by 22 different people of the Senate Judiciary, Judiciary Committee over two days. They were asking questions about a abortion rights, voting rights. They were asking questions about health care, gun rights, etc., etc. But Amy Coney Barrett, she, interestingly, she didn't answer those questions. She knew how to avoid them because she wanted the American people who were watching her live to know and understand that it's not about my opinion. It's about how I approach the law. How I approach the law, not the opinions. She says, I make decisions based off the law, not my opinion. And she described herself as being a, an originalist. An originalist is someone who believes the role of a justice is to adhere to the text of statutes rather than interpret or make policy from the bench. So when, they, when she told them, you know, I'm an originalist, they said, okay, um, in English, can you define the meaning and legal concept of originalism? So, Amy Coney Barrett, she said, in English, that means I interpret the Constitution as a law and that I interpret its text as text and I understand it to have the meaning that it had at the time people ratified it. So that meaning doesn't change over time and it's not up to me to update it or infuse my policy views into it. And I love that stance. She says, I understand the law as the meaning as when it was written back then. And she compared her stance as being an originalist to the famous story, The Odyssey of Odysseus. 
How many of you have heard that? The Odyssey, the tale of Odysseus. It's an old mythical tale. I'll give you a quick rundown. Well, the Odyssey of Homer, his tale of Odysseus or Ulysses, he was a respected warrior. And he was returning home to, to the island of Ithaca from the Trojan War. On the way home, the goddess Circe, she approaches him and says, Odysseus, you need to be careful about the sirens. The sirens were these two monsters who knew how to shape shift to, to pretend to be beautiful undressed women with amazing voices to try to allure the sailors who passed their island to entertain them with their beautiful melodies. So I have this picture here. There was an artist that drew a picture of this tale about the sirens and how they took the image of these persuasive women. Let's check this out. Let's see if it pulls up. There we go. Now I blurred out the women because the sirens portrayed themselves in the Odyssey as undressed women. Now if you look at this, the tale of here's Odysseus and his men coming home and he's passing by this island. And these two ugly monsters, what they did was shapeshift into these three beautiful women. It was weird. And the story was the goddess warns him, you need to be careful because they begin to use their voices to allure sailors. But in reality, they want to kill them. They said, so in order to, to pass by, what you need to do is you need to plug your ears. Because their voices are so alluring and they say everything you want to hear, and it sounds so entertaining. So if you don't cover your ears, they'll pull you away, and they'll pull you to the island, and your fate will be like the rest of these men here who fell for it. They're dead. Bodies are decaying. So she said, Odysseus, tell your men to plug their ears and tell them to tie you to the mast. The mast is that wooden piece going up on their ship. She said, tie the, tell them to tie you to the mast. And if you begin to beg and, and beg the men to unloose you, they must tie you harder. So he did it. And he told his men, tie me to the mast, which I have this picture here. He told his men, tie me to the mast. And as they rolled past, the sirens began to sing, Odysseus, bravest of heroes, draw near to us on our green island. Odysseus will teach you wisdom, will give you love sweeter than honey. The songs we sing soothe away sorrow, and in our arms you will be happy. Odysseus, bravest of heroes, the song we sing will bring you peace. When Odysseus began to hear these, here he is tied to the mast. He began to scream at his men, untie me! Untie me! And his men, they saw him struggling and pulling and pulling. That's why you saw them pulling him and tying more ropes. Because he was getting swayed. He wanted to go embrace them. But what he didn't realize is he was falling under their words. He, to the men, they couldn't hear it. So they, they only saw two ugly monsters. But Odysseus, he was bewitched and he saw these beautiful women. And... And it wasn't until they passed the island that the singing stopped and Odysseus came to his senses. He looked and he told his men, thank you for tying me to the mast. And this was the story that Amy Coney Barrett used in her hearing. She said, my stance on my beliefs in the Constitution is tie me to the mast. I don't care what comes my way. I don't care what policy. I don't care what, what movement. She says, tie me to the Constitution. I'm not going anywhere. I say all that to say this. The only way you and I will make it is if we tie ourselves to the mass that is the gospel. Because there's going to be a lot of voices as you go through life that are going to sound amazing. They're going to sound beautiful, attractive, but they're going to be like those sirens. But beneath all the allure and all the presentation is an ugly two-headed monster with claws named Satan. Who wants to get you to be bewitched and pull away from the mass, pull away from the... The sermon is called, Tie Me to the Mass. And I want all of you to pay attention. 
If you don't have a pen, get one because I'm going to give some scriptures here that I want you to hold down. These are going to be the mass that you must hold down. In Galatians 1, Paul is addressing the church about this issue. And he's noticed that there's been some people who have untied themselves from the mass. They've given to some different words. Some another gospel, he calls it. So he has to address this and get them to once again tie themselves to the mass. Let's read this, Galatians 1, starting at verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that which you have not been preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, other than what you have received, let him be accursed. Let's pray. Father, I pray you would make plain your word on tonight. Let there be men and women in this place that would tie themselves to the mass, that as we ride through the ocean of life, uh, that the sirens will be out there. The voices, the words, the distractions to try to allure us away. But I pray let your word be what keeps us grounded. Anoint this, I have no confidence in my flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul starts off by saying, he's, I marvel. I'm, he's like, I'm shocked. He's mind blown. He's like, how are you so, so quickly you've been pulled away? Unto what he calls another gospel. He's very appalled. He's shocked. He, it's, it's almost like he didn't see this coming. That these people, this church in Galatia, they heard this, these words and all of a sudden, like we saw in the image, they weren't tied to the mass. And the sirens begin to call. This another gospel begin to ring out. And Paul says, you've been removed. In the gospel you hear, it's not another gospel, but it's a perverted gospel. So what does that tell you and I? If we're not careful, we can be removed by what sounds good, but it's not truth. Let's talk about the truth of the gospel first. The truth of the gospel. Back in 2014, there was a... Uh, a man at a, a shopping mall in Pennsylvania. And this man, he is 26 years old. His name's Ryan Burke. He was actually a Purple Heart recipient, served in the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division. So Ryan Burke's walking around the Pennsylvania mall. And he notices this, this man in uniform. He looks at the guy in uniform and he notices something's off. As he gets closer to the man in the uniform, he he sees that this guy, he, he's dressed really inconsistent in his uniform. First thing he noticed was that the American pa uh, flag patch was in the wrong place. Ryan Burke said, wait, red flag. Second thing he noticed is that this man was wearing three combat infantry badges, or CIBs, on his shoulder, which is an extremely rare honor. So Ryan Burke approaches this guy with a camera on his face. He says, hey, excuse me. Where did you receive your three CIBs at? And the guy said, Afghanistan. Then Burke said, you know, in order to receive three CIBs, you would have had to serve in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He called the guy out. He kept asking him questions and questions to come to find out this guy was a fake. He had been milking the system. And he put this up on the internet and then tagged it into an account on, on, on Instagram that was called Guardian of Valor. It was a blog for active veteran soldiers looking to expose imposters claiming military service for medals. Now I say that to say this. If you or I were walking that same mall, we wouldn't have caught that. 
many of us would have probably been like, thank you for your service. I probably would have. Thank you. But here's someone who knows the real deal and says, wait a minute. It's not right. See, the only way to recognize a lie is to first know the truth. In our text, this is what Paul is trying to get to. He says, I'm shocked, guys, that you're turning away. You've been removed so soon from God. He called you away to himself through Christ, but yet you're now following a different way that pretends to be the good news. But it's not the good news. He said, you're being fooled by these deliberate attempts to twist the truth of, of Christ. So Paul saying, guys, you didn't recognize that this was off? Like something was different here? This is the danger. That truth can be replaced by what sounds almost the same. This is why he called it another gospel. So in other words, some men were, were, were coming in and they were saying key words like, oh, Jesus God, love, salvation. But then throw with some other words. And people are like, oh, you, oh, you saved? Oh, yeah, I'm saved. And it's blah, 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 blah. But yeah, I love God. And, blah, blah, blah. and they weren't catching it. He called it another gospel. So he tells them, listen, if me, Cephas, Peter, any of us come here, even an angel come down, a so-called angel from heaven, Preaching another gospel than what you first heard is let that man be accursed. That says a lot. He says, even if I, the one who came here and, and introduced you to Christ, if anything come out of my mouth that is not the truth of the gospel, be accursed. See, my goal this, not just this evening, but while I'm here, my goal is that if anything even if I say anything across this pulpit that's not right, you should be able to say, wait a minute, red flag. If anyone says to you while you're out of this building, you should be able to say, wait a minute. Hold on, that's, that's, that's not right. That's what Paul's saying. He said, if we or an angel preach any other gospel. So that leads us to the question, two questions. What is the gospel and what is at the heart of the gospel? Because unless you know the truth, you can't spot a lie. There was a lady named Elisa Childers. And she was, at time, backslidden for a long time. She talked about how she grew up at a young age. She got saved at about 15. She was radically saved. She eventually joined this girl, girl group uh, called the ZOE Girls. She was traveling America and seeing many people get saved. And she said all of a sudden one day she got introduced to this church and this pastor was doing this study group. And she said, okay, I went to the study group. And she said, we start the study group and the pastor looks at us and says, I invited only you guys because all of you are special. Right? And she said, wait, red flag. Why didn't you invite everyone? She said, but I didn't say anything. She said, the pastor handed us a book. By Brian McLaren, another red flag. I'll teach you that in a lot of day. By Brian McLaren, and it was a book on generous, gen, generous orthodoxy. She said, as we read the book in this class, I encountered a completely redefinition of the word orthodoxy. She said, in this book, I learned that Jesus wouldn't be caught dead identifying as a Christian if he walked the earth today. That red flag. She said, as I'm reading this, my comfort began to grow, my discomfort began to grow with each chapter. She said, yet as I'm reading this and I'm growing uncomfortable, the people in my class were coming to, oh, wow, I didn't think of that. And she's like, what, what's, what's going on here? She says, then we're talking about this in the class, and the pastor says, you know what, I don't identify as Christian, I identify myself as a hopeful agnostic. And she's like, what? But she still doesn't say anything. And she's looking at these people as the pastor's telling them, I'm just, I want you guys to be more free thinkers. She says, then we go back to the book, and the book begins to talk about a concept called the seven Jesuses. She said, this is where this Christian book describes seven versions of Jesus, 
each based on different nominational understandings of who Christ is, and the author urged the readers to celebrate all seven of them. She said it was at this point, I, she was in this class, she left that church, and her faith was completely rocked, uprooted, and she was confused for years. Everything she knew as true was now undone. It broke her. It took her years to come back to the faith, and even then, she's still not the same. Listen to me. The gospel of Jesus Christ will be targeted and targeted and targeted. It has been targeted for years. And the goal is to target the heart of the gospel, the main core of what it is, the beliefs. Because if this is not at the heart, if this isn't the mast that you tie yourself to, you will be like Alyssa. You'll start talking to someone and all of a sudden you'll be doubting everything you ever knew. So there's some major points of the gospel. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his life? Immaculate birth, resurrection. I'm going to dive into 10 points. I want you to write down these scriptures somewhere, whether in your Bible, something. Keep this in a place. These are scriptures you go back to because they are the foundation of what this is. These will be the major points the gospel will be targeted at. Number one, the virgin birth of Jesus. There have been people for years who have been trying to downplay this. Because if you downplay the virgin birth of Jesus, you can throw out the whole gospel. But the virgin birth of Jesus, Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This was years before Jesus stepped on the scene. And here is Isaiah prophesying this. It came fulfilled in Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example of her, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. The virgin birth of Jesus. Hold on, tie yourself to that mass. Jesus was born of a virgin. Number two, in the gospel, is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Everyone knows that Jesus lived. That's not something you have to convince people about. They'll put it in your social studies book at school. It'll be that little mark that says 33 AD, death of Jesus, and then they leave it alone for the rest of the school school year. Everyone knows that he lived. Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. What does that mean? He died. Most will leave it at there. Okay, well, he died. But he didn't just die. Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene. The other Mary and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And to him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He died. He is not here, for he is risen. He rose again, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. This is the resurrection. In Matthew 28, 1 through 6, that's the resurrection. Paul then speaks about it in many places. 
But I'll point out 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all, which, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then all the apostles. He was seen of me also as one born out of time, due time. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose from the dead, which means he's still alive. That will be assaulted. Tie yourself to that mass. Number three. Jesus was the atonement for our sins. That word atonement, it literally means the repairing for an offense or an injury. That it was only through his blood being shed that God would be satisfied. The only way we could make amends was through his blood. It was the reconciliation of God and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That word remission, Jesus says, My blood being shed is going to release from bondage and imprisonment. It's going to allow forgiveness and pardoning of sins as they've never been committed. He was the atonement. Romans 3.25, Paul says these words, Whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. The atonement of Jesus, number three. Number four, that will be assaulted. Jesus is the only hope for salvation. Jesus is the only hope for salvation. Matthew 1, verse 21, right at his birth, the angel says, and she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That is something only God attributed to Jesus. So to call him simply a prophet, you're calling God a liar. God said, no, he will save his people from their sins, not just tell them a bunch of words. He's the only hope for salvation. The issue isn't about us being needing to be taught more things. We're very good at wanting to learn stuff. The issue was about needing salvation. The issue of sin. This is why Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's very exclusive, isn't it? That's because he's the only way. Acts 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only hope for salvation in the world. There may be a million religions, but there's only one empty tomb. He is the only hope for salvation. Number five in the gospel that will be assaulted is the messianic rank of Jesus. Jesus wasn't just a prophet or a good teacher. He was the Messiah. John 1 verse 40, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's Peter brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. John 4 verse 25, Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. That's a bold statement, isn't it? He says, I am the Messiah. There's only one. He's not just a prophet. He's the Messiah. Matthew 16, verse 15. Jesus saith unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Christ is the anointed one or the Messiah. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed. Jesus is saying the words, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And when he saw it, he was glad. Then 
Then said the Jews unto them, Thou art yet not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. This is enough. Number seven, that will be assaulted in the gospel. All people are sinners. All people are sinners. The common thread that's been going around as of lately is we're an inherently good. That we just got to make better decisions, think positive, and et cetera, et cetera. But listen, everybody on this earth is a sinner. Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We are sinners. We can't escape it. We're sinners by our nature. We're sinners by choice. It's the issue. It's why Jesus had to die in the first place. He didn't die because he just gave him something to do. He was bored. He died because we were all sinners. Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Number eight that will be assaulted. The Bible is inerrant. In other words, the Bible is Free from error. People say, well, the Bible contradicts itself and, and, and there are errors and it doesn't line up, it doesn't agree. I want to tell you, there has yet to be one person to show the Bible doesn't line up not only with history, but everything that it says within it. In fact, this has been the only text, scripture, book, whatever you want to call it, that has constantly still been unfolding perfectly in history, even to this day. The Bible is free from error. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. 2 Peter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. It is perfect. It is free from error. The word of God, when you read it from front to back, back to forth, not one of it contradicts. Number nine that will be assaulted regarding the gospel is the reality of heaven and hell. The reality of heaven and hell. Matthew 6, verse 9. Jesus says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. See, it's not the part about heaven that we have a problem with, is it? It's when we start talking about hell. And all of a sudden, everybody that died rests in peace. It's another false doctrine itself. Hell is real. Matthew 5, 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole to be cast into hell. Jesus said that, by the way. He also said this in Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Listen, man, hell is real. Don't get caught up on that whole purgatory. That's a lie from hell. That's, that's another one of the, the Catholic uh, money makers there. We'll, we'll pray your loved one out of purgatory. Stop. Jesus never said that. That's false doctrine. Number 10 of the gospel. Jesus is coming back. The rapture. John 14, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. 
Jesus said, I'm going to come back for you. Acts 1, verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. They're standing by the disciples, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, taken, taken up from you into heaven, shall also come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. He's going to come back. And I'm going to explain the difference between the rapture and the second coming of Christ at a later date. There are two different things, which is why most people get confused about the wording in the Bible. But the rapture and the second coming. Let's keep it simple. The rapture, he's coming for his church. They're gone. The second coming, he's coming back with his church. And he's coming to do business with swords. A lot of bloodshed. A lot of vultures are going to be very happy when he comes back the second time. 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 6, verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That word caught up, when you look at that in the Bible, the word rapture isn't the Bible, but those words, that's what it literally means in the translation, rapture, to be taken up suddenly. This is what's going to happen when Jesus comes back for his church. The Bible tells us that he's going to be coming. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It's going to happen any moment. It's imminent. It's right here. Jesus says in Revelation, he tells them, behold, I come as a thief in the night. He confirms this. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. Let no man deceive you. By any means, for that day shall not come except there become a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. Right? The Bible's telling us the rapture, what's going to happen. There's going to be a falling away. That man of sin be revealed. And he says, at that moment, boom, we're gone. When is that going to happen? We have no idea. But it is going to happen. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity already at work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's the King James Version, but in other translations to better explain it, what he's saying is, that man of iniquity who's right now at work, that man of lawlessness, there's someone, the Holy Spirit is holding him back. But until the Holy Spirit be let out the way, he can't do anything. And what Paul is saying is the moment that the Holy Spirit be out the way, that's when the man of lawlessness will have full right away. Why would the Holy Spirit be out the way? The rapture. When he takes his church, he's taking the spirit with him. I'm going to tell you something, that's going to be a long time to try to make it. Not only without the church, but without the Spirit of God. I'm going to be teaching on the rapture here soon as well. But the rapture is imminent, which means it can happen at any moment. It can occur. 1 Corinthians 15, the last scripture for this one. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In the twinkling of an eye. What he's trying to explain is that at any moment, Jesus can come back. Right? This is something that is real, that, that can happen at any given moment. So I've just explained to you ten points that you must hold on to. That will be assaulted. It will be challenged. The truth of the gospel, it will be assaulted on you, the virgin birth, the life and death, the resurrection of Jesus, the atonement of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only hope for salvation, the messianic rank of Jesus, the deity of Jesus. Everybody is a sinner. The Bible is inerrant or free from error. The reality of heaven and hell and Jesus is coming back now. I close out with this point. Why are those points always so assaulted? You know what this is all about. It's about your faith. 
It's about your faith. There was a Florida woman recently in the news. There's tornadoes going all over the world right now. Louisiana, Texas, it's just rocking the world. There's this Florida woman. She A tornado came through, and she said it made a, a line toward her house. And before she knew it, she felt weightless. She felt her house in the air and spinning around. What literally happened was that tornado came and lifted her house off the foundation. Right? We, we laugh about the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy, but it was literally like that. She went outside to look at her house. It was moved over about six feet from her foundation. Can I tell you that's what this is about? If the devil can permanently embed a tornado of skepticism and, and doubts in your mind... It will effectively hinder your faith. You will never be able to read your Bible the same. You will never be able to pray right because there will always be an inner conflict battling you, saying, well, is that what it really means? Or, well, I've heard this. This is why you have to be careful about letting all this stuff in your brain, right? Like, I fear for this generation because, yes, we have so much access to, to gain knowledge quickly, but... Knowledge quickly gained sometimes can be poison. You have to be careful about typing on YouTube or typing Instagram because you have no idea who these people are. Paul said you need to be careful about these people who are coming in here with all this vain words and they desire to be teachers of the gospel, but yet they don't even know what they believe. You want truth? Start reading this. You will never spot a lie until you know this. How do you know what you're hearing on the internet is right? You're just accepting it because the person you're hearing it from is a trustworthy source? You don't know that. I can be trustworthy over the internet. <laughs> I can win your trust. Smile a couple good times and put my Joel Osteen on and man, I win your trust. You want truth? It's right here. Jesus said to Peter, in Luke 22, verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. But I pray for you that thy faith fail not. What was Satan coming for? His faith. I pray that your faith fail not, Peter. Not you, because you're going to fail. But I pray that your faith withstands it. The sifting. And he says, when you're converted, strengthen your brother." In other words, when you have turned again to the truth and start to know what's right and do what's right, teach that. Strengthen your brethren. It's about your faith. If the devil can sift you, get you off your foundation, even move you over just a foot, you will be uncertain, unstable for the rest of your life. You need to know to be able to call things out and say, no, hold on. I understand the gospel has these 10 points, and what you're saying does not line up with that. I guarantee you, anything that you'll ever hear that will be against the word of God, out of one of those 10 points, you'll be able to spot it out and say, nope, that's not right. Because it don't line up. Because if it agrees with, if it disagrees with this one, then it has to agree with this one, and it has to agree with, disagree with all of them. You need to be able to spot deception. Your faith is on the line. And the devil wants it. He desires to sift all of us. What that looks like, I have no idea. But trust me, he's around every corner. The challenge is don't be naive. Don't be gullible. Not every person that says they're a Christian believes the same as you. A Mormon says they're a Christian too. You need to be like the Bereans in the Bible. That when Paul was preaching to them, the Bible says they were reading the scriptures, following along, confirming, oh yeah, that's right, that's right. Smart people. That's why I give you scriptures, follow here. Because the devil wants to do, right? Jesus called a sifting, but what the devil does in today's terminology, it's called deconstruction. Deconstruction is when, when you systematically dissect the beliefs that you hold as true with the end goal of rejecting them all together. 
It's an analytic examination of something, such as a theory or belief, in order to reveal its inadequacy. See, that woman Alyssa I told you about, who was hearing all that stuff, she came to later find out when she came back to the faith that the pastor, he was what we called a progressive Christian. Progressive means you progress beyond the old ideas of Christianity and, and change them, work on them. So he began to dissect. See, the devil wants to do this. He's going to dissect everything you believe. He's going to go in and dive. But can I tell you, deconstruction isn't something new. He deconstructed right in the garden. Genesis 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That was the word of God, right? And all of a sudden, Genesis 3 Verse 1, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice what he's doing. Taking the word of God, now he's dissecting it. Did God say, Don't eat of the tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said, you should not surely die. What is he doing? He's challenging her belief. He's challenging what she knows to be true about the word of God. And he says, you won't die. In fact, for God knows in the day you eat, that your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. See, he was the first progressive Christian. Fallen angel. He knew all the truths, right? Knew, he knew God probably better than Adam and Eve did. Now his progressive Christianity, did God really say you, you won't die? God's being dramatic. In fact, He's holding back from you. And what happened? He deconstructed her. He analyzed her. He dissected the word of God. He examined Eve. And he attempted to reveal to Eve how what she knew was now incorrect and inadequate. And now she completely explodes. She goes against what she knows to be true, takes the fruit and eats it. And we know the rest of the story. All because Satan sifted her faith. Listen to me. Your faith is on the line. Don't allow the enemy to deconstruct you. You stand on the word. He targets the unsuspecting, which is why I delivered this to you today. Yes, it took a little longer, but this is important because your soul is important. Your faith is important. Hold on to these scriptures that I gave you. Tie yourself to the mass. Don't fall for the sirens. He's smart. He's tricky. This is what he desires to do. But Psalm 33, verse 11, I close with this. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. And the thoughts of his hearts to all generations. No matter what the devil does to try to, to, to sift it and, and make lies out of the word of God and make the, the, the Bible to be the problem. No. The word of God is true. The word of God is true. Tie yourself to the mast. Very quickly, every head bow, every eye close. <clears throat> Tie yourself to the mast. Don't let go of this. Anything in your mind, in your heart that doesn't align, then you say, hold up, no, 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 no. There's a lot of things that even as we learn and grow in Christ, it gets challenged by what we know, what we've heard. There's been a lot of things. 
I want to challenge you, man. Don't allow the enemy to deconstruct you. I've given you 10 solid points of the gospel. Now it is up to you. You need to read those. Make those a part of your faith. Challenge yourself to read those daily if need be until they become a part of the fabric of your spiritual DNA. That you can say, no, I want to be like Ryan Burke. That when I see something fake and wrong and not off, that I can call it out and say, no, that's not right. Because this is what the devil wants to do. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us. And no other person on this earth died for us. Our sins. It's not about just having a positive mindset. Positivity won't cleanse you from sins. It's not about just being better and, and, and being good. Being better and being good won't cleanse you from sins. The issue wasn't us just about doing right. If that was the case, then Jesus' death on the cross was pointless. He came to die for us. He shed his blood for us when it should have been our blood, our cross, our punishment. But he took it. That's the gospel. He rose from the dead three days later with all power in his hands, confirming his words. That's the gospel of Jesus. And that power can set you free, make you whole, make you brand new. I don't care how many chains you came. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The blood of Jesus sets free and makes whole. So as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I ask you right now, what are you going to do with the gospel? You've heard some solid truth today. The question is now, what do you do with that? Because you can't unhear this. You can't just forget about this. The question is, what will you do about this? When you stand before God one day, he's going to tell you straight up, you heard the gospel as clear as day. And, you, and, 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 and now it was on you. What are you going to do about that? I ask right now, and you say, you know what? I got to get my heart right. If Jesus were to come back in the next five minutes, would you go? Would you be left behind? That's for you. I ask you right now, if you're not right with God, if you're not saved, if your heart is not right, just raise your hand right where you are. I want to pray with you. Believe God to help you. Amen. God sees his hand. I want to pray with you, man. Let's believe God here. Tie yourself to the mass. Amen. You raised your hand. Come here, man. We're going to have Jamar come. Oh, you come pray with him. Pray over him. And believe God, man. Hallelujah. I speak to the church. Listen. Odysseus was just a, a, an odyssey. It was just a, a tale. But I want to tell you, this is real. The gospel is our mass to tie ourselves to, to bind ourselves to. And I love how the tale said when, when Odysseus was screaming, untie me, let me loose. He had people around him who said, no, we're not going to let you go. Can I tell you, this is what we need to be for each other. We need to be this for each other. Say, no, don't untie yourself. Don't listen to the sirens. Come on. We are each other's help. We are to keep one another accountable. I want to challenge you. Love your brother, love your sister. Help one another. And you personally, you tie yourself to this like you never have before. Bind yourself to this. No matter what comes your way, what words come your way. Bind yourself to this. Amen. We're going to open these altars. I want to challenge you. Come pray as we sing out this song. Teach us your word. Make an altar here. We're going to pray. Teach us your word. We'll take it to the nations. Give us your boldness.
without a foundation. Nothing. What I've given you today, you read that, you study that, take highlighters to it through your Bible, and say, you know what, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. And I guarantee you the rest of the word of God will point to those ten points. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, they will, those ten points I gave you, everything will point to those. That's how you'll know and say, oh, I get that's how that's why the gotcha that's how the Old Testament points to Jesus and I guarantee you hang on to that man tie yourself to the mass 
Because trust me, the devil desires to sift you like wheat. He wants to get you confused, all messed up, and have you in this fog. And well, I thought, and what about this? And Listen, it's right here. This is the mast right here. Noah built that ark, right? This is the mast. This is what keeps you on it. So hang on to this. Brace yourself. And every time you stand on that, you give the devil a black eye. The Bible says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. How do you resist? You say, I don't care what you say, devil. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not moving. And after a while, he's like, okay, I'll come back in the next season. Well, you know what? When he leaves, you're stronger. You're stronger. Stand on this, man. And God will help. Let's be dismissed in prayer. We'll be back here tomorrow, 7 o'clock. I have the doors open by 645. Let's fellowship, man. Let's bust out some more cookies. We've got to get some more cookies, man. I think we're out. We got two packs? All right. We're good. We're going to eat, man. We're going to have some chicken in here. And we're going to believe God. And let's go ahead and be dismissed in prayer. God, we thank you for this word, this time. We thank you for what you're doing. I pray challenge all of us, Father, to know, God, that there is an enemy out there that desires to sift us like wheat, that desires to confuse us, to get us off target, and want to throw lies in our head. But the devil is a liar, and the blood of Jesus sets free and makes whole. God, I pray, let every soul and heart in this place tie themselves to the mass that is the gospel, the word of God that does not change, but endures forever. I pray, God, help us, God, Lord, to stand wearing the full armor of God, guarding our hearts to be soldiers and warriors in these last days for you. We thank you for this. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Yeah, bro. <laughs>